Boy, I'm excited about today's program um, because you know we have a guest who um, we're, we're going to get a chance to introduce here in a little bit, but um, and uh, and I think you'll find it very interesting and, and 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 certainly speaks to a lot about what we're here to do at the Ionair Foundation to advance technology, to advance care, to make life better for patients. And I think you'll get a real good example of how that can work today. So uh, thank you. This series is, is part of something we've been doing every other week um, through the Ionair Foundation to bring you the highlights of the research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Um, today's topic, cochlear implants, candidacy and new developments. Um, I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ionear Foundation. The Ionear Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from uh, the Ionear Foundation to support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. So thank you all who have given over the years to support the research moving forward. And should anybody ever have an interest in finding out how, how um, to give to the Ionear Foundation, please give us a call. Uh, housekeeping roles. For today's program, you'll see it's a Zoom product, but we do disable chat for today's program. We'll ask you to put questions into the Q&A function on your screen. You can kind of scroll down to the bottom. It says Q&A. Click on that and you can type a question anytime during the program and uh, we'll read the questions at the end. So uh, we really appreciate that. And I think you all um, have some questions for today. Um, you're gonna receive a survey following today's program that we'll ask you to fill out. We do look at those surveys. We share those surveys with our speakers and we get information that's helpful to us in terms of putting on more programs. We'll also add you to a list of emails for future webinars and, and uh, to receive um, and so um, thank you again for your participation. Uh, you'll notice today that we have the closed caption on for the uh, through PowerPoint and I hope that uh, and it helps some of our, our um, hearing uh, disabled uh, individuals. Um, if you ever join and, and listen to any of our webinars, webinars on YouTube, you can use that function as well on the YouTube uh, channel. So to introduce today's speaker, our chairman of otolaryngology, Dr. Jonas Johnson, distinguished service professor and chairman, Department of Otolaryngology in the Eugene and Myers Endowed Chair at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Johnson, take us away. So good afternoon, thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this should be an exciting program. And so I won't uh, spend much time in introducing uh, uh, Dr. Barry Hirsch. So uh, uh, interesting little, um, uh, fact about uh, Dr. Hirsch in our department is he's been with us for the best part of 40 years. And uh, he's been a special leader. Uh, in fact, he's a recent past president of the American Neurologic uh, Association, which is, you know, uh, a, a think tank of leaders in this specialty. So without uh, further ado, let me introduce Dr. Hirsch to you, and he will introduce his guest and go on with the program. Well, th thank you very much, Jonas. <clears throat> Moani, thank you. And Eleanor, we'll get to you in a little while. So um, there's so many people that we have that we care for that are hearing impaired. I wanted to go over some real anatomy, physiology of how we hear and our options for what we can do about it, but really focusing on cochlear implants and the marvelous new innovations that are present that we can look at. So how do we hear? This is an example of a left ear. We're taking a little toward going down the ear canal and we see the tympanic membrane vibrating in and out. And that comes from sound waves. So if we go behind the eardrum, we're looking at the three ossicles, malleus, incus, and stapes, and they vibrate. The surface area of the eardrum to the surface area of the stapes is what amplifies sound so much. Mechanical energy turns into these waveforms and electrical impulses end up going down the cochlear nerve. And that's the nerve that a cochlear implant really works on. So you look at audiograms, those who've had hearing issues, an audiogram goes from low frequency, middle frequency, high frequency. Along the y-axis is decibels, how loud things have to be made. And at each of these pitches, each ear is tested and recorded. 
by convention, the right ear has got circles and the left ear has X's. And this is a very typical pattern of normal hearing. We see that the pure tone average is a low number, less than 20, and word recognition scores are at 100%. So this is normal hearing. But as you get greater amounts of hearing loss, these can be graded in terms of whether it's a normal hearing, mild, moderate, severe, severe or profound. And this is important because it lets us categorize where people are in terms of their hearing ability. So look at an audiogram like this. Here we see low, middle, and high frequencies. And in the low frequencies, it's not so bad, but it really drops off in the high frequencies. Word recognition scores are 76% and 84%. And this is a very typical pattern that we would use hearing aids for and just trying to show you those below here. So hearing aids would be the way to go initially. But who's a cochlear implant candidate? So the key thing is, is that they have hearing loss. So we have an audiologic test that shows moderate to profound hearing loss, uh, poor word recognition. So you give them a list of words and they just can't repeat them. And of course, they're not doing well with hearing aids. They can't have any sort of evidence of ear disease and just as important though, if you go to this technology, they can't say that they're gonna come back hearing like they were 12. It is compromised hearing, but still it brings into the working and listening world. They have to go through cochlear implant testing. And that testing, as opposed to when you have your regular audiogram, that testing is done with hearing aids in place. It's done with sentences provided in quiet and sentences also with some surrounding background noise. And that sort of mimics the real life situation of how someone would do if there's noise in the background, because a lot of people deteriorate with their hearing abilities with background noise. And then we need radiologic evidence that the anatomy is conducive, there's no disease to putting in the implant. This is sort of the pattern that most companies go by. Uh, you can see down here at 40 dB, that's considered a moderate hearing loss. And then especially in these high frequencies, there's severe to profound hearing loss greater than 90 dB. So if that audiogram pattern fits in this region, this yellow region, they're likely a candidate. But again, as I mentioned, you then have to do sentence testing where they can have no better than 50% word understanding in sentences. It's a little even more difficult and stringent for Medicare because that drops it to 40%. So Medicare is, even though it's a more likely population that would need a cochlear implant, it sometimes can be harder to get it approved. But when you have testing done in noise, that sentence score typically does drop quite low. So here's an example. This is a 68-year-old gentleman who had a 20-year history of progressive hearing loss. And we see this pattern where at moderate levels, he's not so bad, then he drops off to below 90 or severe hearing loss in the high frequencies. Word recognition scores were 8 and 6%. But then you add on cochlear implant testing, and that's these lists of words done with hearing aids in place. And you can see that those scores are clearly under 50%, their ability to understand. And if people are doing sort of well, you can add uh, signal to noise, you can add noise to the background, and adding 8 dB above the signal, above the noise, you can see that their hearing still remains quite poor. So this person seeing this pattern and seeing his outcome for the word testing is definitely a candidate. So then we go to get uh, x-rays. A CAT scan is probably the easiest thing to do. We want to look at the anatomy of the cochlea, the basal turn of the cochlea, the mastoid air system, and just to make sure there's no disease and say this is a healthy, healthy temporal bone that we could then proceed with a cochlear implant. So what is a cochlear implant? What does it consist of? Well, there's a microphone that could be at the top here, but often it sits in front of the ear. Then there's the speech processor, that's the computer. That picks up sound and turns it into electrical impulses, which then gets delivered across the skin through a headpiece, through the skin transmission. There's a magnet uh, in this headpiece, there's a magnet in this headpiece, and that's how the two pieces attract to one another. Then of course, there's the wire that has to be carefully fed into the cochlea. 
and goes around the snail of the cochlea to provide the electrical stimulation. So here's a cartoon schematic of an electrode going into the cochlea. And as you advance it, this particular electrode has a design where there's a wire stylet. And as you pull that wire stylet out, it coils around the cochlea. So this is modiolar hugging electrode, and we'll talk about the other electrodes shortly. Here's an example of an intraoperative picture. Uh, we're taking the electrode and advancing it into the, into the round window. And this runs a little bit long, but the idea is that it's a very slow, careful insertion, trying not to traumatize or kink the electrode. And then what you see going on here is a, they're grasping what's called the stylet. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. But advancing in the, the electrode, the stylet is now slowly pulled out. And the electrode has that pre-curved coil to it, and it snails around the cochlea without the stylet being there. So this is essentially where we want to see that, that uh, electrode be placed. We saw the organ accordi, and that's where the spasmal membrane vibrates. The scala tympani is where the electrode goes around that coil of the, of the cochlea. There are three main companies that provide cochlear implants to the United States. There's others in Europe, but they are the Nucleus System from Cochlear, Synchrony 2 from Medel, and Advanced Bionics. The Advanced Bionics and all these companies are very similar, but very different. Here we can see what the processor looks like. That's the behind the ear device. The internal device, the internal receiver and stimulator looks like this, and they all have some sort of electrode that comes off of them. And then this company has a, a type of processor that could be worn actually in water. <clears throat> and we'll talk about those. Medel, another company, <clears throat> they have the internal device. They have a behind the ear processor, which is shown right here. <clears throat> and then there's an off the ear processor as well. And they have the ability to use not only a cochlear implant, but also a hearing aid built in if you're able to preserve the low frequencies. So they can get the benefit of both what's called electric, which is the cochlear implant part, and acoustic, which is the sound part, and it's combined into one de device. Same thing, cochlear has something very similar. This is one of the electric acoustic devices where it's both a cochlear implant and a hearing aid. This is uh, what's called the Canzo, which is an off the ear type of device. So it does not involve any kind of magnet like that. The magnet's already built into this. There are a host of electrode designs, and the surgeon picks not only the company, but also the design of the electrode based on what they want to accomplish. And we work very, very closely with our audiologists in terms of trying to figure out what we think is best for a patient and what they anticipate the outcomes will be. The two main kinds of electrodes are those that sit along and really hug the modiolar area. And I showed you that one uh, cartoon where this electrode, where the wire was pulled out and it just tightens up. There's also what's called lateral wall position electrodes where it doesn't go so, so tightly around the snail. It goes on the lateral wall. And this may be a better uh, electrode for hearing preservation. Again, showing these things in an x-ray form, this is the pre-coiled one. When you take the, the stylet out, it coils right around tight, tight around the cochlea. And this one follows the outer wall of the cochlea, the lateral wall. How thin or thick are these cochlear implants? Well, this is what's, uh, uh, I think, really amazing that, that over time, these have got thinner and thinner. I'm just going to hold up one of them. And I, I hope you can see this. But this is one with this is 3.9 millimeters. So this slips underneath the skin, behind the ear. The, all the companies have them within like a half a millimeter of each other. So it's remarkable wiring technology that goes into that very small space. Here's the one from Advanced Bionics at four and a half millimeters. And then the one from Cochlear I just showed you at 3.9 millimeters. Again, it's sort of remarkable. I showed you examples of the behind the ear processors. And that's what you see. Uh, the processor is the computer behind here. 
They have a wire and a headpiece and it attaches to the head by magnetic attraction. And if it's not using that kind of behind the ear processor, there's the off the ear processor. And literally this becomes so much of a benefit to people who are struggling with eyeglasses when they want to put their implant on the same ear. And sometimes it's a, a competition for the space. But this, this processor, this one is from Medel, has a magnet, has the ability to stimulate. And then it does not require the behind the ear device that looked like the hearing aid. Cochlear has their version called Panso and the same concept. It comes with a little hair clip, so uh, it's, it's uh, secured somewhat, so you're not worried about knocking it off. Now, the next advances have been linking the cochlear implant with hearing aids. And some of the companies have linked up with a certain manufacturer, and any controls that are done to the cochlear implant can be done to the hearing aid at the same time. And these can be controlled even off your cell phone. We'll get into that also. So all the, all the companies have the ability when you have a single-sided cochlear implant to talk to the hearing aid on the other side so they can present the signals in a, in a uniform manner. So this is an example of what's called bimodal. We just mentioned that here's the, uh, the cochlear implant with the stimulating head, the headpiece. And this would be the hearing aid that would fit on the patient as well, providing sound both through the ear and providing electrical signal through the implant. There are various wireless accessories that are available. And I think this is what's really amazing, that you can have your cell phone in your pocket, get a call, and that cell phone message rings into your cochlear implant. And by this Bluetooth capability, you're able to hook your phone to the processor. Same goes with anything else that puts out sound, like a TV. You can get a special adapter box that hooks to the TV and sends the sound right by Bluetooth to your processor. And then if you're in situations where you're worried about not being able to hear somebody speak or they're in another part of a car or a room, they can have or carry a remote microphone. And that remote microphone can directly feed right into the implant without any uh, wired connections. So there are various connections in streaming. And again, this is an example where these devices can tell you the status of your cochlear implant. There's even a, a, a feature where you can locate a missing implant. If you control the streaming all off the cell phone, which is just um, remarkable technology. And again, here's where you could hook this device up to your TV and it would send the signal to your device. Medel has the same kind of devices that try and provide all these kind of different uh, services in different situations and ele electronically it's just a marvel. Now the next thing that's amazing, think about having a, a hearing aid and going in a pool or in a shower. That would be the end of it, it just shorts out. But that involves sound waves and the like, but this is all with electrical currents. So all three devices are safe to go in water and underwater. So here's an example of uh, advanced bionics. They have a device that can be worn on a bathing suit or on the arm. This is called the aqua case. And this is all waterproof and you could wear this in water. And, and the virtues of this is just think about little kids. You know, a little kid, if you were to throw a kid in the pool and he doesn't have his uh, hearing abilities on, you know, that child is, is really just deaf. Now you have the ability to, you know, watch, monitor, and talk to a child, even though they're in water. Uh, all three companies have the ability to make these uh, water watertight devices. Here's another thing that's been developed over the recent past few years. What you're seeing there now is an MRI scan, and they see that big spray artifact. Where you're seeing the brain sort of on the left-hand side over here, but what's all this blackness? And this is with some of the earlier cochlear implants where the magnet is still intact in the cochlear implant and it creates this huge artifact. And then when they were able to take the magnet out, the artifact still remained, but it wasn't as, as pronounced. All three companies have the ability to have their current magnets put into an MRI scanner without any taping or wrapping of the head, which had to be done until recently. 
They all have magnetic designs that lets them go into, that, into the MRI unit safely. It still may cause some artifact, but at least they don't have to have the magnet removed. Here's the one from Medel. It's got sort of a north-south orientation and the magnet inside of that just rotates like a top. Uh, and when you do that with the magnet in place, you still see a lot of artifact, but with these newer ones, without the magnet in place, if you really want critical imaging, that magnet can be surgically removed, it gets your imaging, and then you can go put the magnetic magnet back in. Advanced Bionics won awards for their design here, and inside this part where the magnet is, they have cylinders that actually rotate based on the magnetic field that they're subject in. Here's where the cylinders are, and not only do the cylinders rotate around, this whole uh, all, circle also rotates in an orientation, so it's two-dimensional rotation and really three-dimensional rotation. So another really unique design of being able to put a magnet that's safe to go in an MRI scan. Coca Corporation has a sleeve that can come out, but their magnet also can orient with uh, that of the magnetic field of the MRI. And this sleeve, if you really want to get a critical uh, image, then you can do a small incision and take that sleeve out and then replace it. We also do intraoperative testing now. This is where we're able to determine if we think the cochlear implant is in the right place and we think it's moving and we think it's working. So here's a sterile antenna and magnet that gets held up against where the internal magnet is. And from the computer in the OR itself, the electrodes are stimulated individually and recordings can be done to see if we think the device is properly working. So the first things that are recorded is what's called NRT. Uh, and the NRT is, is looking at the integrity of the nerve and integrity of the implant. And we're seeing these tracings here, which in this company has 22 electrodes, that the NR, NRT showing the impedance, the amount of resistance is very, very low, which is what you want to see. You don't want to see high resistance, which may suggest that the electrode may be out of the cochlea. And then we tested the, each electrode individually. This is showing an example of testing electrode six, and we see this waveform, and that beautifully just demonstrates that that electrode is, is doing, it's like an ABR, but it's called neural response telemetry. But then you can run into a, a problem. If this happens, it is really, of great concern because you have people who have very bad hearing possibly, but they develop or show no signs of intraoperative neural response telemetry. So those waveforms are absent. So what could that mean? It could mean a faulty insertion or it could be the device is bad. So getting some x-rays when people were out of the uh, OR, it can give you an idea that here's an, an electrode that's what's called a tip foldover. So that's not in good position. Here's a good example of a tip fold over. And then you look down at this electrode and it's hard to see, but when it's blown up, this electrode's all coiled on itself. So what we've done is uh, we did a study on anatomic cadavers and we tried to optimize, figure out what is the best way that we could get pictures intraoperatively with a portable x-ray machine. And we have, we did the series of different uh, intensities of the, the uh, cone beam and the angle that the head's at and the angle that the central beam is at. And we came up with this protocol that was published uh, uh, two years ago, showing that uh, hang, have, getting a imaging at a 45 degree angle and a slightly cephalic angle to the cone beam can let us see the electrode quite, quite nicely on a uh, portable x-ray. So that really helps. But if you get into this situation where you have no responses at all and you get x-rays and it says, hey, look, the device is in there, but there's something that's going on. What we did was another study. We looked at patients who we've done over the years and out of 333 implants that we reviewed where the data was available, we found 15 ears or 14 patients where we couldn't get any of those responses, that neural response telemetry. 
And they say, well, do you go to the backup device? Because in the OR, we always have a backup device in case one gets damaged or one we think is not working right. But rather than going to the backup device and we did get x-rays and said it's in the right position, after six to 12 months of turning the person on, it was remarkable that they went from hint scores, which is a sentence understanding from 0% in most of the years, that you got nice recordings of these people and they even could approach 100%. So despite intraoperatively of having uh, responses that says they're not present at all, they can come to near normal hearing. So it really was uh, uh, an eye opener that yes, you can have absent responses. You don't have to go to the backup and just rely that they're gonna do better when they are get hooked up and stimulated. The next topic I wanna to cover is that of if you can preserve hearing in the low frequencies. And there are different ways of doing that. And you say, well, what's the benefit? Well, I showed you those electric acoustic devices, but if you can use an electric acoustic device, the amplification of those low frequencies really can help the quality of hearing. And in order to save hearing, we've got to employ some soft surgical techniques and even consider using hearing, uh, hearing preservation electrodes. That means electrodes that are designed to not be as traumatic as some of the original ones. So here's a, a very good example of something we did a couple of years ago. Here's your pre-op audiogram and it's fairly poor hearing, hovering around 60, 65 dB in the low frequencies and it drops off a lot. And they're certainly a cochlear implant candidate. This person ended up undergoing bilateral cochlear implants, separated by time, of course, one in 2017 and one in the following year. But the point to be made here is, here's where the hearing's coming in with the left and right cochlear implants, but also we're able to preserve hearing. And in preserving hearing in the low frequencies, they're eligible to use electric acoustic stimulation, hearing aid plus cochlear implant. So what's the benefit of having low frequency hearing preservation? It helps people hear in the background with the background noise. So it helps bring in speech a little bit easier and lets them understand understand despite having competing noise. Another really great feature is that people do not sleep with the cochlear implant at nighttime. So they're sound aware when the implant is taken off. And that could be a you know, great virtue for safety and the like. And by having low frequencies, it seems that it helps the quality appreciation of music. And people describe this as having a more natural sound. Next new, this, issues that we have is dealing with single-sided deafness. We're looking at an audiogram again, and the left ear and X's is showing the responses are hovering right around normal. But this right ear has a profound hearing loss. And the usual thing we see with profound hearing losses is really we don't know, we assume it's a viral loss, and they can have a sudden immediate onset hearing loss that doesn't recover. Head trauma can cause trouble to the cochlea, fractures and the like. Meningitis, as we'll hear from Elena, can cause a severe, profound hearing loss or even severe Meniere's disease. So with these causes, you know, what can we do about them? Well, you could put what's called the cross hearing device on the right ear, and that'll send sound through the skull. Uh, that would be a bone anchored hearing aid or a cross hearing aid is like a hearing aid, but it's a transmitter of the sound signal and sends it over to the left ear, which has to wear something. But what just came out down the pike was uh, one of the companies has FDA approval for putting a cochlear implant in the deaf ear. And that means the other ear is normal or can have a mild loss, but putting an implant in a deaf, deaf ear, single-sided deafness was unheard of just years ago. So what are the um, qualifications that one has to be meeting in terms of being eligible? It can't be in kids under five years of age. The single-sided deafness, you have to have a profound hearing loss in that right ear and normal or mild hearing loss in the other ear. But you can also have greater hearing loss. It's called asymmetric hearing loss, where the profound hearing loss ear does get the implant and the other ear can still be working with a, a hearing aid. So there's a lot of leeway that can happen with this um, single-sided deafness but their hearing abilities has to be proven to be very, very poor with the hearing aid in place. They have to have had some experience using the hearing aid and failed that before they can be considered a candidate. 
And the other key thing is, it says that you cannot put these in if people have had hearing loss in that ear for greater than 10 years, because it's just so unlikely that the brain's gonna be able to interpret those signals. So less than 10 years and very bad hearing. What's the benefit of implanted a single-sided deafness? People who get single-sided deafness unfortunately experience severe, very incapacitating tinnitus. Sometimes it's not that prevalent, but a lot of times it is. And with an implant that can provide electrical stimulation to the inner ear, uh, that, that shows that they could diminish the, uh, the amount of tinnitus that's going on and help quiet it out while the device is, is off. And then with the device being active, it even more so suppresses the tinnitus. It improves, again, speech performance of noise, as I mentioned. However, patients right off the bat have some difficulty still figuring out where sounds are coming from with single-sided deafness and a cochlear implant. It takes them at least six months for the brain to you know, process the different sound signals that are coming in. So where are we now? Um, I want to take a look at this audiogram. Hopefully you've had experience looking at your own. If not, you've seen a few of them in this talk. And this is showing hearing levels at the mild to moderate level and just heading into the severe hearing loss level. Now, the word recognition score, you may not be able to see it down here, is 50% and 54%. That, up until now, is a hearing aid candidate. And it'll be somewhat of a struggle because the word clarity is not as good as you like. You can end up getting one out of two words right, so to speak. There are middle ear implantable devices, but what we're hoping for, the, the things that I just covered about being able to preserve hearing, better techniques for doing the surgery, possibly uh, additional medications that may help reduce trauma. Can a cochlear implant be done for this kind of hearing loss? And if that's the case, I think the quality of sound will be greatly enhanced compared to the hearing aid where it's frustrating. The hearing aid doesn't do well with background noise and it may not provide that clear signal of word rec recognition. So over, over the past half hour, I've tried to go over the issues of hearing, how we hear, convention of hearing loss and how we use hearing aids. And what are the wonderful technology advances that we've seen with cochlear implants? At this time, what I'd like to do is introduce our honored guest. This is Elena. Hi. So Elena um, lost her hearing when she was about four years of age. She had what's called meningitis, and meningitis can unfortunately really affect the cochlea, and it can cause a scarring process. And she went through this firsthand. She had both ears that were deafened. An attempt was made to put a cochlear implant into the right ear. And that was by my predecessor and mentor, Dr. Don Kammerer, who I'm pretty sure is listening with us. But unfortunately, due to uh, meningitis and what's called labyrinthitis ossificans, her ear was so scarred that it could not have permitted the electrode. But they went to the other side shortly thereafter, a few months later, and successfully put an implant in. I think you can see at the time when she had her implant, there's a wire going from here and the, the processor was a box that you wore on your, on your clothing, on the, like on a belt. And now this is who we have. <clears throat> so Elena, let, let's go over a little bit of what you've been through and what it meant, let's say, coming out of the deaf world and going to DePaul where you had your early education. Can you share some of that experience with us? Absolutely, yes. Thank you for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? You're great. Good. Yes, Elena, thank you. I um we good? Okay. I never had a fancy work from home setup because I am a uh, reporter. For those of you who watch Channel 4 in the morning specifically, you may recognize me. Um, so there was no such thing as work from home for me. So I don't have any cool setup. I have like, you know, this makeshift thing going on. So making sure you can all hear me here. Um, but yeah, I, I did lose my hearing when I was four from bacterial meningitis and it was 
really challenging for my parents. And, um, you know, I know we have quite a variety in the audience of our viewers here. So uh, maybe there are some parents out there listening to this, but it was challenging for my parents because they didn't even know another person who was deaf, let alone anything about cochlear implants or the surgery. This was 25 years ago. So it wasn't as easy to just, you know, hop on Google and get that type of information. And, um, you know, they, they, from what they heard from doctors and they spoke with an audiologist, they learned a little bit about the Paul. Um, they decided it was the best choice for me because I loved theater and dancing and singing. Wasn't the best at singing. Actually, I was pretty bad at singing, but I loved it anyway when I was little. And um, they knew that I would probably want to be in a hearing world. And since there was that option, they decided to move forward and uh, try the cochlear implant surgery. And as Dr. Hirsch mentioned, it failed in the right ear because of the meningitis, but the left ear proved to be successful. And um, if Dr. Kammerer is on this uh, meeting here and listening, um, or even if he's not, I just have to say he is like my forever hero and I cry when I see him. <laughs> and, um, you know, he is just the most amazing person in the world to me. Uh, I'm forever thankful for him. Um, I'm sure all his patients and Dr. Hershey patients feel that way as well. Um, and I told a little funny story to the group when we were kind of running through this. <laughs> we used to buy Dr. Kammerer or uh, make cookies for him. And Dr. Kammerer, you can probably agree with me if uh, you're on this, but uh, we used to make a tray of cookies for him at Christmas. And the one Christmas I was probably seven or eight years old, I was so upset with my mom. And I told her, we need to get something more for Dr. Kammerer. And she's like, okay, what do you want to get him? And I said, we need to buy him a car. <laughs> We didn't get him a car. Sorry, Dr. Kammerer. But, uh, you know, that just proves how much from even a young age. I just loved him and was forever thankful. Um, but my, my uh, after I got the surgery, my time at DePaul was wonderful. I think oral deaf education is such an important part of someone's hearing loss journey. If they're, if they're um, going on to the speaking world, le learning those listening and spoken language skills, the cochlear implants, certainly a big part of it and having that technology, but I would not be where I am today or have accomplished the things that I have in my life without having gone to DePaul and gone through the speech therapy and learning how to lip read and be an advocate for myself. It wasn't just those skills, but it was also learning how to speak up and how to say, I need help with something or um, you know, this is my cochlear implant. This is what it does. I can't explain it like Dr. Hirsch does. Even to this day, people ask me how it works. And I'm like, you just push the button on the top and it turns on. I don't really know. <laughs> so Dr. Hirsch was a much better person to describe all of that to you guys. But, um, you know, the DePaul, I say I'm forever indebted to them. I have volunteered. I've been a spokesperson and advocate for the school. I've uh, served on committees for the school. And recently I was appointed to the board of trustees. So it's a big honor for me to be able to give back to them because I really am so grateful for everything they've done for me. But beyond that, my parents did enroll me um, or I guess sign me up maybe is a better word in pretty much every activity they could think of. So I was in piano lessons. I was in the percussion ensemble at my school. I was in so many dance classes. I learned every genre of dance, including tap, ballet, gymnastics. My implant flew off my head quite a few times back in the day when I was doing my tumbling tricks. It would just go like flying across the room. It always still works somehow. It's pretty sturdy technology because <laughs> I was just pop it back on and it would keep working. So it was fine. But um, yeah, they had me in musical theater. I was in about two dozen productions. Um, yeah, I, my parents really made sure that I was involved in so many different things that I was not just learning those skills in school at DePaul, but also I was exercising and practicing them for hours outside of school, whether it was listening to music and learning how to play, um, listening to the music while I was dancing, speaking, learning monologues, singing. Um, and that really benefited me in my life. Not that I do any type of singing or musical theater nowadays, even dance, I don't do that any longer. But at the time, it was exactly what I needed in order to really succeed and get to where I am to this El point. Eleanor, you've been recognized, obviously, statewide, nationally. You didn't share that you were Miss Pennsylvania a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yes, I was Miss Pennsylvania in 2016. And um, 
Oops, I'm sorry. I was Miss Pennsylvania in 2016. I was Miss Pennsylvania Teen USA in 2010 and Miss Pennsylvania's Outstanding Teen in 2007. So three state titles. Um, the most prestigious was probably Miss Pennsylvania in 2016. I competed at Miss USA, uh, which was a really cool experience. But beyond loving being on that national stage and competing at a pageant and, you know, the photo shoots, the glitz and the glamour that comes with it. What I really loved was how many opportunities I had to share my story with others and spread the message about oral deaf education and, um, you know, how it really changed my life to have gone to DePaul and how this technology really changed my life. Because I feel like um, there's even still a lot of people who have no idea what cochlear implants are. Um, and I remember watching a video, I forget where, maybe something for AG Bell or cochlear, but uh, someone was going out on the street and asking people, what's a cochlear implant? Just to see what the general public thought. And that some of the answers were comical. Like people thought it was a type of plastic surgery. And, um, you know, I think unless you're sort of in this world or you know somebody who has a cochlear implant, you may not know even what it is. So just the opportunity to spread that on a larger scale was really an honor for me. Um, and it was just a great experience being Miss Pennsylvania also. Can you share what happened? You, you related a story when your battery just dies and you're left holding the bag, having to produce talk without oh, hearing Oh, all the time. All the time. All the time. I like to say I'm like the most unprepared, prepared person ever. Like I'm very A-type and organized. And, you know, I, I like to think I have all the skills and my life together, but my batteries will always die at the worst possible times and usually that means when I'm on air broadcasting to our you know hundred thousand viewers in the morning um so I was explaining to Dr. Hirsch and the group that I actually I have a cochlear um America's brand cochlear implant and I have the N6 so for those of you who um you know are familiar with the implants that's one that I wear and I'm joking, I was thinking when you were saying how, you know, the can is nice because you don't have to worry about fitting it behind your ear with glasses. I was thinking back to a few months ago where I had glasses, my implant, a mask. So I had the hooks over my ears, earrings, a baseball hat, and my hair pulled up in a ponytail. <laughs> my ear was like sticking out like so far. My fiance was like, how many more things are you going to fit behind your ear? You have like six right now. <laughs> so those those new implants are nice, but uh, I don't have that one. I still have the N6. Um, but yeah, I, I, where was I going with this? Oh, how my batteries die. So yeah, I'll be on the air broadcasting in the morning news or doing the traffic or even anchoring sometimes and my batteries will just stop. And, you know, I'm talking and I'm, I'm giving a story and maybe something serious even. So it's not really, um, I guess, it would be very awkward for me to stop in the middle of talking about a homicide or a fire and say, oh, I'm so sorry, my cochlear implant battery stopped. I have to change them real quick. So I just keep talking. Um, and I just try to like get through it. I know my voice changes a little bit when my implant shuts off. Um, if you have an implant, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm just like, well, I don't know if the viewers notice that uh, they reach out to me about it or tweet at me about it. I'll explain what happened to them. But usually nobody notices. So if, if I kind of suddenly get wide eyed and my voice changes a little bit, if you're watching the news in the morning, you'll know what happened. My batteries died on me again. <laughs> Elena, if I, I would just, when you, when that happens to you and you lose your battery, do you have any hearing at all? Not, no, I'm 100% deaf in both ears. So, um, yeah, I can't hear a single thing. I can feel like vibrations. So if, um, you know, there's some like a really, really loud noise or at night I use the, um, the alarm clock that has the vibrating disc. I can obviously feel that shaking the bed, but no, I can't hear a single thing. It, it truly is remarkable. Um, one, Dr. Hirsch, thank you. Remarkable technology, of course remarkable changes in surgical techniques and all the things that we, we heard about today. But Elena, how um, wonderful to see that, and you know, again, I think for, for me coming from, from what we try to do with the Ioneer Foundation, how wonderful to see when the work and research and technology that we're trying to do to really improve patient care results in somebody 
who has managed, who has been able to use that technology in such a, a you know, really positive way and, and really, um, you know, to, to live such a, uh, you know, a, a remarkably productive and, and, you know, what people consider to be a, a life that isn't, you know, it, you wouldn't know that you have the, the, the hearing loss that you have. And that's what I think is really impressive um, in, in seeing everything that you're doing. So we're going to open it up to questions. Thank you. So, um, and, uh, and so I already see we have a bunch. So I, I'm going to read those and uh, Dr. Hirsch, Elena, uh, and, and, and hey, Dr. Johnson, if you want to join back in, um, anybody would like to it, it, please answer these questions together or, or independently, however you like. Um, so first, are cochlear implants appropriate for people with limited hearing in one ear? I guess, Dr. Hirsch, or? Well, if there's very limited hearing in the one ear, yes, this recent approval by the FDA for putting a cochlear implant in that ear can be done. You need to go through the appropriate testing to see how bad that ear is. And the other ear, there's a lot of leeway between it being normal or a moderate loss so yes, it's, it's an exciting thing. If the ear has been hearing impaired for too long a period of time, again, you may be disqualified for that. But the best way is to what one is look at the ear, make sure there's no ear disease, get a hearing test and judge the quality of the hearing and the quantity of the loss. And then have that discussion if they're a candidate to talk about single-sided deafness. It's just coming online, so to speak, we got to get insurance companies to also approve it, but with the FDA approval, that should make that discussion a little easier. So I, there's another question that, was, that that's a popular question. I see that kind of the next question is similar, but I'll ask if you have partial hearing, does the cochlear implant um, does it does it make you uh, more successful with a cochlear implant than someone that has total hearing loss or or um, I'd say yes, because if there's partial loss, there's still integrated cochlear nerve fibers. So more than likely you have a better chance at stimulating than if somebody is totally profound off the board. And Elena, when you lost your hearing, which you know was was sudden and profound, as I understand, um, do, you, do you remember again you're four years old, the difference between hearing without the cochlear, cochlear implant and hearing today is, as you do with, with your implant, is it, is it profoundly different or is it? From when I was, how I was hearing when I was, um, I'm sorry, my mom just walked in my house, believe it or not. <laughs> and you guys were so funny because you said, send this invitation to your mom. Well, she didn't just tune in on her computer. She decided to show up at my house. My dog went crazy. So I apologize about that. <laughs> um, we said so hi. Is the question, do I hear how I did when I, before I lost my hearing? Yeah. How, how different is it in terms of hearing in your best that you can remember between well, you know what? I don't, I don't really remember that. I was so young. I had just turned four when I lost my hearing. So um, I don't really remember too much from that time, but I know some cochlear implant users say that everybody's voice kind of sounds similar or, um, you know, you hear that people's voices sound like Darth Vader, things like that. So I think the <laughs> cochlear implant experience is different for everybody. But for me personally, everybody's voice sounds different. If I don't know you very well, I may not be able to, um, you know, pick up your voice in a crowd. But, you know, my mom's voice sounds different from my friend's voices, which sounds different from, you know, my co colleagues' voices. Um, even in the morning, on the morning show, when I am listening through my IFB, I call it. It's what um, the news anchors use to hear the show and the producer's cues in their ear. Um, and I obviously don't do the same thing. I kind of have an adaptive thing I do with my implant and I use the um, phone clip. For those of you who are familiar with the Cochlear Americas technology, I use the little phone clip. I call into our newscast and then that's how the producers talk to me and how I'm able to hear our newscast when I'm out in the field. So 
where I'm going with this is we have Kelly Fry and Michelle Wright in the morning. If you watch Channel 4, you know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I can even tell their voices apart when I'm just listening to the newscast through my phone flip, through my phone, and they say, oh, and Ella Delacroix is here to tell us about, you know, what's happening on the scene. I know which one's tossing to me because their voices sound different to me. Um, and I don't know that their voices sound to me the way they sound to you, someone with normal hearing. However, my mom always tells me I'm very good at like mimicking people's voices. So I think, I'm, I, think I do hear <laughs> pretty similarly to the way someone with their authentic hearing does. I'm not sure, but I am like, my mom always says I have a backup career in comedy because I really am good at like mimicking <laughs> people's voices and impersonating people. So that's remarkable. If the news doesn't work out for me, you can come see me at the improv theater. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Hirsch, uh, one of the questions here is about, um, is there an age limit for cochlear implants? Elena had hers at four, and, and obviously that, that worked out very well. Is there an age limit when you would give some? Well, you, you got to ask bottom and top when you're asking that. In other words, can a little child get a cochlear implant? And the answer is certainly. They've been doing cochlear implants in kids as low as six months, if you can prove there's no hearing and no benefit for uh, hearing devices. So usually it's, it's hovering around age, eight, around age one is when you entertain that idea. Uh, that's handled more at our, our children's hospital under Dr. David Chi and Dr. Fitzko. Then you can talk about the other extreme. So I've done people who are 92 with a cochlear implant and it's all based on one's you know, physiologic age. Are they healthy enough to withstand that? So there's, it's almost a lifetime range of where you can do this and what ages. Are they covered by insurance? Yes, just yes. Uh, but there are exceptions. Some, some people may have a policy that actually writes in and excludes such devices as that. And that's really a shame, but um, almost always insurance covers it. Medicare covers it. Medical assistance, so to speak, covers it. So the, the answer is almost a uniform yes. Well, and, and the, the other question here, is it possible to get a copy of this presentation to share with family members to learn about the cochlear implant that my daughter will have? So the good news is for you. We've, certainly we, we have, uh, are recording this and we will broadcast it on uh, our website. So we, it'll be available in a few days at www.ioneer.org and you can certainly share that with anybody. Um, it was mentioned that 10 years of reduced hearing loss can make one not a candidate for cochlear implant along with ear disease. Well, what are the thoughts for patients with, uh, with MD? Uh, M MD, I, I, is that, um, I was hoping maybe Dr. Hirsch oh, would go at MD. Maybe Meniere's disease? Could Meniere's you disease, probably, yes. So Meniere's disease is more often in one ear, it's occasionally in both ears. The other, ear can be, the other ear can be normal or it can have a mild loss. So yes, if the level of hearing loss is so severe in Meniere's disease, of course they're a, can, a candidate, provided they go through the appropriate testing. Now Meniere's disease is a disease of the inner ear. It's not a source of infection in the mastoid of the middle ear. So it should be safe to do that. So I guess along those lines, are there certain causes of hearing loss where a cochlear implant maybe doesn't work? It's a great question. So you have to think about the hearing pathway. And as you go from the cochlea, if it's a very abnormal malformed cochlea at, at birth, that may be a difficult ear to put an electrode in. And the one that could affect adults more so is where there's compromise of the hearing nerve, the cochlear nerve. And the prototypic example of that would be somebody with an acoustic neuroma. So if they have an acoustic neuroma that's growing from the balance nerves and pushing on the hearing nerve, it's a possibility that you cannot necessarily get a good signal to go down that cochlear nerve to the brainstem. So that's called retrocochlear. If there's a concern for the integrity of the cochlear nerve itself, an implant may not be indicated. So, you mentioned that insurance does cover hearing uh, the cochlear implants. 
Does it limit? Do any of them like Medicare say we'll cover this one, but not this this one, this device, but not this device? Not by brand. Nope. Okay. The brands are, are open. Uh, and I have not necessarily seen examples where it said you can't have bilateral implants. So once you go for one, it may come up, you know, a peer to peer. We'll get somebody uh, on the phone who says, I, I don't want to spend that much for a second implant, meaning the insurance company. And we very much go to bat for people. So um, this one, I think, Eleanor, you would be able to answer as well as Dr. Hirsch. Can people with cochlear implants play sports or do sports activities or wear a helmet? Eleanor, did you freeze? Because I, I, think I hated I... sports. I used to get out of gym class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys Eleanor. hear me? Yeah, I think we, we lost you for a second. So uh, we, the question was, can people with co cochlear implants play sports or do um, yeah. activities? Wear a helmet? Oh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, they totally can. And I never did. I was saying that um, I actually used my implant and deafness as an excuse to get out of gym class in school. <laughs> <laughs> but um, don't follow in my lead. I'm a bad influence. Um, no, <laughs> people totally can. And um, several of my classmates at DePaul back in the day, I know went on to do high school sports, soccer, football, everything. You do have to be cautious. Guessing and Dr. Hirsch can probably speak to this more. But like I said, with my gymnastics, my implant would go flying across the room and I was still okay. Um, so I, I really think anything's possible with the implant. Um, you know, there may be some precautions you have to take, or maybe like with my job, some adaptive things you have to do in order to make it work. But um, yeah, I don't see why sports would be an issue. Um, but maybe Dr. Hurt actually give you a medical answer, because like I said, <laughs> I'm probably a bad influence. And I think that great example is about being able to go in a, in a, in a swimming pool with an implant. I mean, it's just, that's a sport and it's, a, it's remarkable for kids. That's fantastic. Has there been successful people with uh, sarcoidosis that have lost hearing in one ear and could uh, lose hearing in, in the other ear? So that, that's a disease potentially of the temporal bone. It could affect the inner ear. It potentially could affect the cochlear nerve. So you'd have to go through testing to see where you are with a routine audiogram but more important to get an idea whether the cochlea would support uh, putting in an implant like that. Uh, in, in days gone by, we used to do what's called promontory testing. There's a way of putting electrical currents on the promontory to see if the ear is still stimula able to be stimulated. But I think with the current cochlear implant testing techniques, we should be able to determine that you would be eligible with sarcoid, as long as it doesn't infiltrate or affect the cochlea itself where we can't get the electrode in or it's retrocochlear and there's sarcoid inside the head. Well, that is all of the questions and we're right at the hour. So um, listen, it has been a lot of fun. Dr. Hirsch, thank you. Um, as always, uh, we will look forward to seeing you in your clinic uh, and all of your patients. We all know, uh, appreciate that you're there and the help that you're providing. And Elena, we'll look forward to seeing you on WTAE. And, uh, and again, it, it, every time I do see you, I'm always uh, very proud, but also uh, very just overall impressed with how well you, uh, you, you carry on your responsibilities. Uh, not a question here, but from uh, yeah. Dr. Cameron, uh, you were doing a great job covering a topic which is dear to my heart. Elena, I've always been very proud of everything you've accomplished from Dr. Cameron. And one last question, oh. Felina. <laughs> uh, one last question, Felina, would it be possible to ask questions uh, or hear more of your story beyond this webinar? Well, Dr. Elena, that's, we would love to have uh, more uh, beyond this webinar. Um, and uh, and I've, I know you've done things on WTAE about your, um, you know, you know, your, your hearing loss and other things. So, um, so I, I, I guess more to come to that, to that question, <laughs> we'd have you back anytime. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know what, please feel free. 
whoever asked that or whoever's interested, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm very easy to find on social media. Just search Elena LaQuatra. I think I'm like the only one in the world with that name. So that's good. Um, but yeah, I pop up like my work page will pop up on Facebook or if you're on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, it may take me a few days to get back to you, but feel free to reach out to me on social media. Or if you just want to hear more about my story, you can just Google me and there's tons of articles out there. So, um, but yeah, I, I love talking to other people. Um, hearing their stories, giving advice. It's not really medical advice, but, <laughs> you know, I'm happy to share my story and my experiences if that's going to help um, somebody or even give somebody a little bit of hope or inspiration going through this journey. Very important. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, everybody, please enjoy the, the beautiful day and have a wonderful weekend. Um, signing off here from the Ioneer Foundation. Thank you all.